We're in 1 Samuel chapter 27. We're actually going to go through 27, 28, and 29, kind of in rapid order tonight. Now, you remember David and Saul's last meeting. Once again, Saul admits that David is the righteous one and that David will be the inheritor of the kingdom. Uh, after they part ways, David takes his 600 men and they move back into that area that is controlled by King Achish. Do you remember when David moved into King Achish's neighborhood and uh, people brought David to him and, you know, here's this guy that's always been defeating Philistines and uh, he let the spit drool down his chin and acted crazy and Achish said, well, why are you bothering me with this guy? He's obviously crazy. Just leave him be. Well, this time David comes back and he's got 600 of his friends with him. Uh, Achish gives them a place to live. It's a little town called Ziklag. And so David and his men and all of their holdings move into Ziklag. And that will be important later on. But David's two wives are with him. Many of his men have their wives and families with them. They have all kinds of flocks and herds that they have basically won in battles against other people. And so they all move to Ziklag and set up shop. Well, to keep favor with King Achish, David begins doing raids in the neighboring area. Now, Achish was fairly far south in uh, the uh, Philistine area. And so south of there is that area they call the Negev, N-E-G-E-V. And it's kind of the area between Israel and the Sinai Peninsula. Right? So uh, the Israelites came up from Egypt through that area. So some of those people groups they encountered on their way up. But after living in Israel all these years, there was, there was still a lot of those people that just lived between Israel and Egypt in that slice of real estate that goes down to the west of the, uh, the great river there. So he would go and raid settlements, he and his men, to the south of Israel and Philistia, but he would lie to Achish about where he had been and who, who he had been fighting. He would tell Achish that he was fighting against the enemies of Philistia. So he would go down into this area that is basically just south of Judah enemies that would have been enemies of his family all of his life, he would raid them, he would kill them, men, women, children, wipe everybody out, uh, and then go back and Achish would say, well, where have you been? And he would say, well, I was in this area, which is more south of Philistia. And he would tell him all the stories about uh, winning all these battles. Achish loved him. Achish thought he was a great champion. And the whole while, David is lying to him and uh, really making sport of Achish this whole time. Uh, the reason that they kill everybody is so that no one will live to dispute his stories. This isn't like when they moved across the Jordan under uh, uh, Joshua, where they came across and God told them specifically when they got to Jericho, kill everybody. This is David's decision. We're going to kill everybody so that you don't have someone who goes back and tells Achish that we were attacking their people. Why are you harboring David? Because David is attacking our people and you should be in league with us. And so anyway, David says, we'll just cut out all that problem and just kill everybody to begin with. And so that's what he does. Nobody is alive to dispute his story. So in the meantime, he's depleting the enemies of Judah. Uh, he has some level of asylum living there with Achish. So Saul isn't going to go into Philistia looking for him in the Achish territory. Uh, so he has a really good setup where he is, and that goes on for some time. So that's basically uh, 27. Uh, by the time that you get to the end of 27, just look at the last verse, verse 12. Achish trusted David, and he said to himself, He has become so obnoxious to his own people, the Israelites, that he will be my servant for life. So he, he bought it lock, stock, and barrel. Uh, the people of Judah, the tribe of Judah from whence David came, loved him too because he was doing them a great favor by the battles he was fighting and the battles he was winning. All right, look at 1 Samuel 28, uh, verse 1. 
In those days the Philistines gathered their forces to fight against Israel. Achish said to David, You must understand that you and your men will accompany me in my army. David said, Then you will see for yourself that your servant, what your servant can do. And Achish replied very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. So King Achish is that deep into it. But fortunately, unfortunately for David and his companions, uh, Achish's men, his commanders, were not as in love with David as he was. Look over at chapter 29, and we'll start in verse 5. Isn't this the David they sang about in their dances? Saul has slain his thousands. David has, his, has slain his tens of thousands. So Achish called David and said to him, As surely as the Lord lives, you have been reliable, and I would be pleased to have you serve with me in the army. From the day you came to me until today, I have found no fault in you. But the rulers don't approve of you. Now turn back and go in peace. Do nothing to displease these Philistine rulers. But what have I done, asked David? What have you found against your servant from the day I came to you until now? Why can't I go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? And Achish answered, I know that you have been as pleasing in my eyes as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the Philistine commanders have said, he must not go up with us into battle. They were worried that David would get into battle with uh, against Israel and just turn around and start killing Philistines. And they were right. <laughs> That's probably exactly what would have happened. So Achish, uh, he's always playing the part of the fool. Even when David is acting crazy, it's Achish that's really the fool in the scenario. And, and David lives to fight another day, and he doesn't have to go to battle against his own people. So David and his men return to Ziklag while Saul and his men get ready to go and do battle against uh, the Philistines. Now, chapter 28, verse 3. We see the picture of a guy who is on the edge of disaster. He is shut out from his leadership role. He still has people that follow him, but he knows good and well he's not the real king. Uh, he knows that God is going to displace him that his dynasty is dying, is almost gone. And he's getting more and more scared. He, he just doesn't know how to approach the situation or what to do about it anymore. So look at chapter 28, verse 3. And just look at the ingredients that we get in verse 3. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had mourned for him, and buried him in his own town of Ramah. Okay. Saul had expelled the mediums and spiritists from the land. Why do we need to know that? Verse 3 tells you pretty much everything you need to know, right? Samuel is gone, he's dead, and Saul has gotten rid of all the mediums. So there's nobody that can, can bring Samuel to him. There's no one that can get him the information that he needs, that he so desperately wants. Look at verse 4. The Philistines assembled and came and set up camp at Shunem, while Saul gathered all of Israel and set up at Gilboa. When Saul saw the Philistine army, he was afraid. Terror filled his heart. He inquired of the Lord, but the Lord did not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Saul then said to his attendants, Find me a woman who is a medium so that I can go and inquire of her. Saul is terrified. He realizes that his army cannot overcome the army that he's seeing there with the Philistines. And he can't get God to talk to him. He has been ostracized by God for the purpose of keeping him under check. Right? God's not going to lead him. God's not going to help him. He's just out there on his own. And he shows what a poor leader he is being out there on his own. But notice the, the phrase, the Lord would not answer him by dreams or Urim or prophets. Okay? Dreams, sometimes God would come to people in their dreams and give them answers to things. The Urim, where are the Urim and Thummim? Who's got them? David does, right? David has already been asking God questions using the Urim and Thummim to find out the answer. So Saul doesn't have them. He can't get the answers 
to the things he wants. He may have a set that he has devised, right? At, when I was, oh, I don't know, about 12, 13, we had an old pool table in the house. And I would decide great questions of my future by shooting pool, right? If I can clear the whole table in 21 shots or less, then this is true and that's not true. If, if I can clear it in 20 shots or less, then this is true and that's not true, okay? Really, it's, it's foolproof. You should try it sometime. Every, every answer you come up with off the pool table is, is absolutely true. Uh, that's where Saul was. He had nothing. He, he wanted so badly to get an answer from God, he was trying to come up with ways to get it, and God wouldn't answer him by any means at all. And then there's the prophets. Samuel was a prophet. Samuel was the head of the schools of the prophets that we run into. He was the beginning of all of that movement of the prophets. Samuel and Saul were on the outs. Right? When Samuel died, he and Saul were not speaking at the time. So how many of the students from the schools of the prophets are going to go help Saul? Is God going to give him answers to his questions through the prophets? Of course not. And so there he is. He is lost. So he says, I'm going to break my own rule. Which, by the way, it's a good rule. They had run all of the mediums out of the territory. Uh, some of his men said, there is one at Endor. So Saul disguised himself, putting on other clothes. And at night, he and two men went to the woman and said, consult a spirit for me and bring up for me the one that I name. But the woman said to him, surely you know that Saul, uh, what Saul has done. He's cut off the mediums and the spiritists from the land. Why have you set a trap for my life? To bring about my death. So we find out a little bit more. He hasn't just run them out of town. They were run out of town on threat of death. If you're found to be a medium, then we're going to kill you. So the woman is terrified. She doesn't want to help whoever this guy is. Uh, and so all he can do is swear to her by the Lord. Right? I swear to you by the Lord. As surely as the Lord lives, you will not be punished for this. Now how ridiculous is King Saul calling the name of God Almighty and saying, as the Lord lives, I promise. A, Saul never keeps his promises. And B, what right does he have to have the name of the Lord in his mouth at all? He hasn't given us anything to believe that he's really God's man anymore. So, but he makes the promise and the woman buys it. So the woman says, whom shall I bring up for you? And he says, I want to talk to Sam. He knows who knows. And the fact that Samuel is dead doesn't stop him from wanting to get an answer from the one who knows. If there's any way I can get a, an audience, God won't talk to me. The prophets won't talk to me. The Urim and Thummim not doing me any good. So I got to go to Samuel because I know that Samuel knows. And so this woman calls for Samuel to come out. And as soon as he does, she knows that something's up. And I don't know whether this woman was a fraud, whether she couldn't really conjure up or have seances or uh, be a medium as she claimed to be. But whatever the case, she calls and Samuel shows up. And nobody in that group is happy when he does. Right? Samuel is unhappy because he was disturbed. His answer when he comes up is, why in the world have you disturbed me? Right? I was happy where I was. Now he doesn't tell us where he was. They use the term bring up. Right? So that's kind of interesting. Uh, when he comes up, he's described as a ghostly figure coming up out of the earth, an old man wearing a robe. And that's how Saul says, well, I know who that is. That's, that's Samuel. But the woman is terrified because I'm not sure that she knew that Samuel was going to show up. But he does. And of course Saul is terrified because he and Samuel have not been on good terms for a long time. And now Samuel comes in the form of a ghostly figure. Uh, I don't care who you are. When the ghostly figure shows up, that's a little scary. Well, even if you called for him to show up, when he shows up, that's a scary thing. And so everybody in the group is terrified except Samuel. Samuel's just upset because 
he was resting. Thank you very much. Uh, when he comes and gives Saul the information that he needs, it's not good news. I mean, there's no way that it could be. But God allows a medium to call a spirit to give Saul the news. It's the exact same news that Samuel has given him before. This isn't anything new. It's just set in a new surrounding. We have a uh, dead man giving the news instead of while he was living. Uh, verse 16, we'll start from there. Samuel said, why do you consult me now that the Lord has departed from you and become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David, because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites. The Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will deliver both Israel and you into the hands of the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. The Lord will also give the army of Israel into the hands of the Philistines. Tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. Now again, we don't get an indication of where with me is. Uh, he came up. Uh, the, the concept that the ancient Hebrews had was, as, was of a place called Sheol. And Sheol was just kind of the general place of the dead. Maybe uh, in Greek we might think about Hades, the general realm of uh, spirits, disembodied spirits. So Samuel's saying, you guys will be where I am. You'll be in the same situation uh, in which I find myself. In other words, tomorrow you'll be dead. And so Saul, is he knows that these things are true. He, he has no reason to doubt anything that Samuel is saying. So immediately, verse 20, Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength was gone, for he had eaten nothing all that day and all that night. So Saul's blood sugar drops out completely, and he faints. He lays out on the ground just flat out. The woman knows what to do. She says, I need you to get up and eat something. And Saul says, I'm not going to eat anything. I don't want anything to eat. But it takes all of his men who are with him to encourage him to finally get up and to listen to the woman and to eat. Uh, so he got up from the ground and he sat on the couch. The woman had fattened a calf, this is verse 24, which she butchered at once. She took some flour, kneaded it, and baked bread without yeast. She set it before Saul and his men and they ate. And that same night they got up and left. Okay, So this is an evening meal dinner meal, maybe a description of Saul's last meal. You know, when you know you're gone tomorrow, what do you want to eat tonight? Right? Barbecue and bread. That's what that's what's, was on the menu for Saul. Barbecue and bread, and he ate it, and they went back to the encampment. Uh, Lord willing, next week we'll look at a couple of battles that took place uh, fairly close together. One is a battle between David and a group of Amalekites who break into Ziklag while they're away and steal their stuff and take their wives hostages. And so David and his men have to go fight that battle. And then there's a battle in which Saul goes up against the Philistines in which Saul and his sons are indeed killed. So all of these things are kind of meshing together. We've known for years what was going to happen. But now it's there. It's going to happen tomorrow. The time is immediate. And I guess that's true in, in all of our lives. We, we look down the pipe and we think, well, yeah, I've, I've got a lot of years left. And then you go down a few more years, we've got a few less years, but we still think in terms of, you know, we're going to just keep going, we're going to just keep going. Saul has known for a while now that something was going to happen to him. And then Samuel comes up and says, Tomorrow is the day. So, Lord willing, we'll take a look at that stuff next week. Anybody have any questions? Thoughts about any of this? Yes, ma'am. It's not a question. I just wanted to say I have a great admiration for Jonathan. Mm -hmm. Because no matter what kind of dad he had, he stuck with him. He did. Yeah, Jonathan was very loyal to very different people. You know, loyal to his dad, stayed with him, went into this battle with him. 
uh, ends up losing his life, and at the same time, very loyal to David. He's the kind of guy you, you'd want sitting at your table. You know, Jonathan would have been a great friend to have whatever situation you might run into. Anybody else? Anything you want to add? No? Okay. Tell you guys bye. <laughs>